Ecological approach is the only way. I'm, I'm intense, man. You see me, right? But, <laughs> but at the same time, we don't speak Japanese, so uh, Gorami means nothing to it. Is this outside Ashi? Is this outside Ashi? Is this outside Ashi? Is this outside Ashi? Is this out an English speaker? You don't have to tell your coach. Just honestly, plug your fucking ears and they're talking. Giancarlo, all those guys. Gordon Ryan, I always watch them. And I've actually noticed something. They're a little bit not cheap. They look like robots. Yeah, it's a little stiff. It's stiff. Do you feel your life these days has been more fulfilling? Um. All right, awesome. Cool, man. Okay, cool. <laughs> <laughs> cool, so um, I have Greg here, um, very famous for his uh, evangelism of the ecological approach. Can we say notorious? If we're going to say evangelism, we have to say notorious. Okay, notorious, can't say yes. Famous. That's correct, yeah. Um, and I was here yesterday, and um, he answered a lot of my questions, and I thought some of the answers were really interesting, so I asked him if he would be willing to record this on camera, and maybe we could um, have even a, like, a deeper discussion. So. Yeah. I was hoping we could go over some of the things I already talked about yesterday, so this might yeah. be like repetitive. Um, so Sorry, I think no, the biggest misconception about you and your school is that you actually do have a system. Of course, of course, of course. We yeah. Do. So maybe you could talk a little bit about that. Yeah, but what do you mean by system? What part of our system? You mean the way we talk about jujitsu? I guess in the sense that there are specific outcomes you're seeking mm -hmm. in your jujitsu, and For there sure. are like funnels that you are creating Perfect. towards positions that you or, yeah, yeah. or areas that you like. Yep. Yeah. So. Everyone's heard me talk about this already, right? So we play the game of immobilization as it leads to strangulation and breaking, okay? So we take that framework and we, we can ask ourselves the question to start. What does complete immobilization look like? What does preventing from being immobilized look like? What are the actions that are taken during this struggle to immobilize someone and to resist being immobilized? And that's where we start, right? So we can talk, talk about a simple thing. Let's talk about the different guard positions, okay? So we differentiate guard positions only to having three real types. And then again, we can, we can slice it up, you can make it more general, but here's how we start. Closed, just meaning I can close my legs around a waist. Open, meaning my legs are open, and this is, this is both expressed through a seated structure and a belly up structure, and then halves. Halves are two legs interacting with one, all right? To whichever degree you're lined mm -hmm. up with. So that's our first general approach. And now we can say that some guards, however, based on their orientation, are more mobile than others. So let's take what we would call a neutral guarded position, the seated open guard. We're not connected yet, we're seated up, and we're ready to engage. So one way that we get a specific tactic to emerge is from this position is first to understand that again, we're trying to, the top player is trying to immobilize the bottom player. So what's the first action that a top player could take against a bottom player, in this case in the seated open guard, to start to immobilize them in the, most, in the, in the simplest way possible? And that first is put them on their back. We know that a body is more mobile when it's seated right. than it is when it's belly up. Right. So again, we prioritize this action because it increases in mobility. Now, the difference between, let's say, our approach in a, in a traditionalist model is I don't think there's an optimum way to do this. I think there are many ways to put somebody on their back. So rather than teach this specific prescriptive process-oriented way to take a seated player and put them on the back, we just help our students understand that by having them try to do it. Mm -hmm. Now, we might orient their focus to make this easier, like we call that game when we take a seated player and putting it on their back, push, pull, pin, right? So the mm -hmm. idea is that you can push someone to their back right. in varying uh -huh. ways, you can pull somebody to get them to go belly up, right. and you can pin them in their position and try to get behind them, right? Because yeah. if I can attach to you, that's also a form of immobilization. And when the back is off the mat, that's also present, so it creates a little bit of an initial dilemma. So again, we start with the game, push, pull, pin, we give an objective, put your partner on your back, and then we give a task focus, you know, maybe, mm -hmm. you know, start by trying to get your head and hands in front of them and use your head and hands to put them on their back. And then mm -hmm. tactics emerge. Yeah. I think even what was interesting yesterday, I asked you about how you taught breaking mechanics and you mm -hmm. explained you have, it was, uh, you called it like lateral force into the joint is like For how sure. you break a limb. Well, specifically to the leg and specifically to twisting locks on the leg. Right, right, right. Yeah. So I think that was really interesting to me because you do have a theory on breaking mechanics and you're not necessarily letting your kids go like free reign and like <laughs> twisting and like pulling on a leg, but like you're still trying to convey your theory on breaking mechanics, sure. right? Well, let's look at something. I can even show you on camera yeah. so you guys can give yeah, a yeah, physical yeah, example, yeah. right? So idea. this is what I showed him yesterday, right? I, I said, okay, look, when, let's say, let's talk about something that everyone knows about, outside Ashi, okay? And when it's traditionally shown, what people will show is they'll show the outside Ashi as being an entangled leg in a straight heel position with our legs on the outside, right? And we start at this lateral angle and we call this outside Ashi. 
But then we, we immediately run into a problem. How are we defining this? Is this outside Ashi? 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 Is this out? I mean, so where is the degree of definability? Um, and so rather, what we really consider is we align our hips relative to our opponent in this specific alignment where our feet are entangled at the hips, locked to the outside, based on what we're trying to do with this leg. If we're trying to create a bend, our alignment is going to look different. If we're trying to catch the toes, our alignment might look slightly different. Based on our partner's hip position, relative to their, their building base, uh, creating frames, whatever, is going to look different. So it's hard to define as a perfectly uh, steady state. All right? And so the way we would describe this would be uh, outside entanglement is how we call it, because we don't, we don't speak Japanese, so uh, garami means nothing to an, an English speaker. So outside entanglement, this just means we entangle the legs by accessing the hip. And if it's outside, our legs will be on the outside. This just gives a point of reference as to where our feet are. So when we look out, they are outside the lines of our opponent's body. And so this would be the way we start to teach this situation without calling it anything, just outside entanglement. And then we let the um, priority of structure emerge based on what we're trying to do in this given position. Now let's continue one second, and then I'll, I'll shut up, and you can ask me another question. Now why do we, we show it with our knees pointed this way? You hear this, and you hear this, this gripe. Oh, outside position is bad, or excuse me, outside entanglement is bad because it gives a path to the back. So we need a threat present to prevent this. Well, that's just a misunderstanding of the function of this position. With our knees pointed laterally at the hip, this is a breaking position. This is a breaking alignment. So of course, if we have the toes and we have the heel and we have our hips pointed laterally at the knee, we can defend our back because the threat of the break is here, right? So hips this way pointed at the lateral side of the knee is a breaking alignment to some degree. So instead, like, why would you show this to start? Instead, why not just uh, show them that there are degrees of difference between where we want to line up to break and where we might need to line up to protect the, our opponent from coming forward at us? Again, because our alignment is relative to the task. So uh, this is how we help our students understand when and what to do. I think also the outside Ashi analogy was really eye-opening for me because I've heard you in podcasts before talk about how, like, what is a triangle that means nothing? Like when we're talking about language uh, and talking about positions, like it literally means nothing. Our eyes can see what's happening. And then I think it made it much clearer when you explained that like, to what degree are we calling this the position? Because it's all the same. Correct. But you had um, a point yesterday where we talked about how instead we can use language to talk about functions. That's right. Yeah, and I think that was really interesting. Could you elaborate a little bit on that? For sure. Yeah. So by function, I mean the effect we're trying to have over our opponent's body. So when I engage with you, if I connect with you in a specific way, if I structure my body in a specific way, if I move in a specific way, it's relative to the function I'm trying to have or the effect that I'm trying to produce on your body. And again, this is always in flux because my opponent's going to resist me when I start to connect to it, structure to it, move relative to it, or try to move it. Um, so yeah, so again, we, we, we can talk about alignments in like a broad sense, but to get very specific, we have to really talk about functionality. We can't really just talk about how and here. We have to talk about why and when, you know, and we have to guide that through better language. Right. Yeah. yeah, I mean, that totally makes sense. It's like, why even be, even if it was accurate, like, why be redundant with our language when we I can agree. see what's happening? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I agree. Um, okay, so I kind of want to shift into some questions from yeah. my friends. They, I told them Let's I was coming, so I wanted to ask, they had some questions. One of them yeah. um, just got his blue belt recently, okay. so um, he asked, Considering like ADCC results alone, Team New Wave seems to be like the best team out there right now. Sure. Yeah. Um, but their methodology of training is different th from your own. And what do you have to say to that? Like, do you, in the in the sense that they have better results than your team currently, or sure. from the past ADCC uh, season? Yeah. Well, there's a lot of factors to consider here. So it's not a simple metric of training methodology versus training methodology. Mm -hmm. We're talking about John Danaher a man who has 30 years of coaching experience, or so something in that range, 30 years of Jiu-Jitsu experience. He is a famous man where people will come to him and offer their time and energy and train with his team. And you get a bunch of motivated people like that that are willing to stay in a room and start to work, that is, has a strong effect on what we can produce with that room. We have to remember that coaching methodology is a supplement to motivated indiv individuals with similar intentions for practice, with similar goals. If you take a bunch of tough athletic people who have the same goals and put them in a room and they learn the rules of the game and you say fight, you're gonna get a lot out of that. Autos, right? So you're gonna get a lot out of that. But now if you take a coaching methodology and you layer it on top of that, we can guide that effect in a more 
uh, precise way, right? Right. Yeah. So, so again, back to Danner in, in his method. So, again, I know that Danner does situational sparring, which is of course a, a great way to organize focus. Um, we have a lot of live work. Um, and a lot of very uh, particular focuses. So I, if you read John Danaher's philosophy, if you read the little posts he puts, puts up, if you listen to the 20 minutes that he puts on, on, on Facebook, he's, he's basically creating a, a concept that he works within. But people, for some reason, only focus on his methods. So even though I think his guys could be wasting a bit of time with static drilling met methods, they are at least doing the base work of highly motivated guys who have serious focus, uh, against a, a knowledgeable coach, you know what I mean, who's at least showing them things that we know work. So there's a lot that's going for them. And we have to understand there are many ways to reach success. It's not just mm -hmm. the ecological approach is the only way. In my right. mind, I think it's a better way. But again, I have to prove that. Right, right, right. But again, I'm not working with the same numbers that Dan is working with. Right. I'm working with 90 Jiu-Jitsu students. Only eight of them <laughs> are what John Danner would have, like right, the, right. the six, seven day week guy. Right, right. You know? Like you yesterday, you were talking about students versus members. Correct. Right, right, right. And you're saying you have like eight dedicated students. For sure. Yeah, yeah members are just people who are here, like having right, fun, right. doing some jujitsu. Students are like people who are the students of Greg Souders, the people right, that I belted right, right, from the right, beginning, right, right. or even the, some of the candy move higher belts mm -hmm. that have dedicated to the process that we're trying to show here. Right, right, right. Yeah. I think also because you're so outspoken about the method, like my initial take on you was that you were going to be very like strong headed, but I was actually yeah. really surprised. You're actually a, like a pretty humble guy. Like I feel like yesterday when we were talking, you um, talked about how you've had to adjust some of your games. For sure. Um, what are some of like the mistakes you feel like you made early on when you were trying to implement the ecological approach that you feel like you've had to like revise? Well, so I understand two parts. So one, a little about my personality. This, this is a problem. I'm a very direct and a very uh, confident guy. Like I put a lot of work into this. Right. So when you ask me a question, I'm going to give it all my passion to try to convey it to you. And it might not be appealing at first because I'm, I'm intense, man. You see me, right? But, <laughs> but at the same time, that's my job. My job is to like get the point across and like let you know what I'm trying to say. Yeah. Um, and the problem is a lot of people who are approaching me aren't as well read and aren't as well yeah, practiced yeah. in the method. So rather than really ask me questions and try to dig deep and engage with me, they want to either like say, no, it's wrong because I feel like it's wrong, or they're approaching me with a poor understanding of what they think the method is. And that's frustrating to me, mm -hmm. and I have a hard time emotionally yeah, handling that. So I, well, the first thing is now, I need to do a better job at communicating in a less intense and more clear way so I can reach a larger audience. So I understand that's one of my weaknesses. But for the ecological approach itself, my first weakness that I was just I didn't understand it. Like I, I, I was reading it, it was a very complex scientific information, and it's not for jujitsu, it's for anything. So I had to basically take what I thought I was understanding and try to apply it to something without any help. I didn't have a Rob, you know, I didn't really have Rob Gray to ask. I tried to, you know, read all the shit, but I didn't have anyone to ask advice for. So I had to try it on my own. But again, uh, the first mistake I really just made was I, I started applying it with a poor understanding. But again, I don't think it's a mistake, right? We, as beginners, we all are bad at what we do. Right. And going through the trial and error process is a gift. You know, mm -hmm. failure is how we adjust. And success is how we know we're kind of headed in the right direction. So we use that as a metric for which direction we should or shouldn't go in. Um, now, um, the first mistake I made, really I think is actually the, the own main one. I didn't commit fully to it right away. I would still like, okay guys, we're gonna warm up with movement. <laughs> we're gonna do three steps to get to this and then three steps to get to this and three and I just tried to shrink it down as small as I could mm -hmm. But it still was not having a good effect. It still had no effect almost so not until I pulled the trigger in 2016 and stopped showing things and stopped teaching techniques did I start to really constrain myself to try to use Different ways to create skill in my athletes and then once I committed to that I started seeing a lot of, of fruitful outcomes mm. um yeah, I think, yeah, that, that was probably my main mistake. I just didn't commit to it. I, I should have committed earlier and sooner, but I'm happy that it only took me two years. Do you have any recommended readings for people who want to, like, learn more about the ecological approach itself? Oh, yeah, for sure. I mean, I, I, anyone who knows who I am has already heard me say this uh -huh. over and over again. Uh, How We Learn to Move by Rob Gray. Okay. Learning to Optimize moves, Movement by Rob Gray. And the reason I use him is because I think he's taken a lot of the complex information and kind of shrunk it down and made it digestible. And so it's a really nice access point to people who are unfamiliar with the science. Um, uh, not, and the, the next book would be Nonlinear Pedagogy and Skill Acquisition. This book is a little more dense and it's a co as a, at a college read, reading level. Yeah. Um, but it talks about coaching in general and how to use this nonlinear pedagogy. And it teaches why learning is itself nonlinear. Um, and so it, it can really help the new coach sort of inform his practice. Mm. I think that manual is more close to application than, say, Rob Gray's book is. 
I think Rob Gray is more on the side of theory and sort of where it's going, uh, but but not not the whole part. There are some parts there's some application in there, but again, I think the nonlinear pedagogy uh, has deals with application a little more directly. And then finally, the constraints led approach, and this has many authors. Um, the, main, the main author is Ian Renshaw. He's like the he's the constraints led guy. Like he's the, the the guy at the head of building constraints led practices. Uh, that book is great. It really teaches you how to use the four principles of you know, constraint led approach, uh, which is um, intentionality, repetition without repetition, um, representative design, and uh, what is the, oh my God, how am I gonna forget that last one? Oh, constrained to afford. So it teaches you what all that means and how to utilize it. So it's okay. a great book. Okay, interesting, interesting. Um, so going back to um, like talking about your students and specifically uh, DeAndre, yeah. I, um, I think I know what your answer is going to be, but like, and back to the new wave thing, like, yeah. where do you see your students' like potential? Do you see DeAndre as like a potential ADCC champ, or maybe even like your students? Do you feel like your guys are kind of on the road to that right now? That's a really hard question, but for yeah. DeAndre specifically, 100%. And I'm not saying that because he's my student. He's literally my favorite jujitsu person ever. Like watching his habits, watching him train, mm -hmm. watching the amount of effort and dedication he puts into, into his day. I don't say this lightly, okay? If anyone's come stay with him for a week, you'll be exhausted by his existence, <laughs> all right? And so I see this, right? I yeah. see this. And um, the people who put effort like that are, in my opinion, deserving of some outcome, um, no matter what they do. So I think he's the guy that deserves to be that guy, yeah. uh, if you can even say that. But I just, yes, I believe he's going to reach that goal, I, without a doubt. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, he has all the qualities that it would take to get someone like him to that level. Yeah. Um, and you, we've seen his impor his performance increase for sure yeah. dramatically for in the sure. last three years. Yeah. Like look at DeAndre post 2020. Look at DeAndre now. He's a different human. Yeah. Um, and so he'd responded to the way we do things here very well. Mm. Uh, we have a good student coach relationship. Mm. And uh, I spoke to some of uh, your students actually before. So and I learned about like his day he's probably the most professional jiu-jitsu athlete i've ever like heard about just like hearing his days his weeks this past year is actually insane his work ethic like i i can't believe it honestly no it's really wild like i, I i'm surprised by it too uh he's been on a seven day week schedule since december because this year is very important for him uh he hasn't missed a day of training and like, yeah, we, we're insane. eight months in and he hasn't yeah. taken a day off now when people hear that they think oh i just got to go hard what they also don't understand is how dedicated he is to recovery. Right, right, right. Like, uh -huh. I'm telling you, like, he calculates his food. Like, he keeps a journal of his, you know, I uh, heard his about calorie this. Yeah. intake, his macro micronutrient intake, how he feels it changed. Right. His, I mean, like, holy shit. The, the notes he keeps on himself is incredible. Yeah. And not only that, he works a full-time job. That's, he's that's he's an engineer. Yeah. He gets up at 4.30 in the morning to start his day, you know? And, like, everything is about either what he needs to do to work, to train, and recover. Everything else is stripped out of the picture. Yeah. Like, he wants his morning to be so efficient that when he wakes up, his phone, his coffee, and everything is outside the room and it's all at the same spot. So he can hit all the <laughs> buttons at the same time so he doesn't have to waste any time starting his day. Um, he has a morning routine, for example, that he always does. If we're in a hotel and we have to take a flight at four in the morning, he's already up an hour before doing his hour morning routine. Like, he just, it's wild. It, I, it's wild. <laughs> and like, it's just, uh, the crew talking to Andre, it's a funny thing. Like, and people say all the time, like, you know, you should be getting submitted a lot in training. Now, DeAndre's not the type of dude that does do different things. But no matter how variable I make his training and how novel I make it, it's so hard to beat him at anything we give him. Like, I think he's probably been submitted three times this whole year in practice. And I'm not talking about, like, you know, he doesn't take risks. I'm talking about the only, three times in a year. And I'm talking about hard-nosed, starting in submission type shit. It's incredible, man. He's a just, man, wild athlete. I yeah. love the guy. I love you the know, guy. He's really impressive, honestly. Like, yeah. honestly, very, like... Uh, admirable for his work ethic. Um, so I've heard you talk in podcasts about DeAndre and how when he first came here, and you told me yesterday he would struggle with even your blue belts. Yeah. But I mean, now he's here and he's training with those same people. Yeah. What's so special about him, even in those early days, that he was able to overcome those same guys who he was struggling with, training yeah. in the same method? For sure. So he came here as an athlete. Uh -huh. And so when he would win exchanges, it was with sheer physical ability. Like he would outwork them, outpace them. So he already had this wonderful habit of workmanship that he would use to solve the physical problem. Now, that, that's, that's commendable, but it's not enough. Right. Because if you're getting submitted on the legs every 30 seconds, every 90 seconds, or you, know, you can't complete a guard pass and you're at the black belt level, that's a problem. You can't, I mean, he had a difficult time holding people down. He had a difficult time getting off his back. Mm -hmm. It's like, 
and again, this is against people who have trained for two to four years, and he'd already been training for 10 years at this point. So that, that's what we mean by he struggled. It's not that he couldn't outwork them. It's not that he wasn't a better athlete. He was all those things. But he needed that to be more focused, right? He needed to be uh, more physically certain about the actions he took and the outcomes he was searching for. And so uh, that's what made the difference. He was able to switch very quickly. He had no emotional attachment to anything he learned previously. And he asked me, what are you doing differently? And what can I do to improve? And I told him, if you move here, I will work with you. I will do everything in my power to make you reach whatever goal that you want to reach. He switched his job, he moved here, and he's been here since. And now everyone is skeptical of this. I know, skepticism is healthy, it's good. Mm -hmm. Ask him, and why do you think someone like DeAndre and his brother would switch their whole lives to move here mm -hmm. if there wasn't something they were getting from this room? Mm -hmm. So again, the difference was, is he's more than what everybody else is, and now he's focused. That's why he was able to just overcome everyone in the room. Mm -hmm. They were just very focused on the training. They, you know, other guys, they. You know, party a little bit or hang out a little bit and don't take the recovery and their 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 training that's that's my guys are serious but not that not as serious as deandre and so that makes the difference right i see yeah um so what recommendation what recommendations do you have for someone like me i mentioned yesterday how i'm moving to taiwan in a month and i'm not going to have like elite level coaching like i won't have Marilla, i won't i won't have someone like you you know guiding like the task focus or the games so what recommendation do you have for someone like me in terms of like designing my own training when I don't have someone above me to like kind of help. First is you don't need someone above you to help you. I wouldn't have been able to be, been able to be me uh, if that were true. Wh who was the Greg Souders for me to ask? Who was the who was the Marillo Santana to help me with my training? I didn't have any of that. Mm -hmm. I was on my own. So what I did was I did the work necessary. I learned the science that I wanted to use, and then I started applying that right away. I wasn't afraid to fail. I pulled the trigger. I put everything on the ground and, and I, I started seeing what I had in front of me and I started working with the pieces. And I did everything in my power to deepen my understanding. I watched hours and hours of match footage. I'm talking about jujitsu, freestyle wrestling, folk style wrestling, I mean anything that was grappling related. And I tried to distill it down and I tried to filter this through this, through this new ecological lens. And then I started just building it back from the ground up. Now I don't know if you want to go that deep. But if you want to, it's available to you. Yeah. You would just take a similar path. And then, of course, you could always interact with me. So <laughs> okay, when you okay. get to Taiwan, yeah, 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 if yeah, you need yeah. me, you reach out. I got you. No okay, worries, okay, man. Okay, okay. Uh, so I can help yeah. guide you along. Uh, but either way, you have that power on your own. Uh -huh. uh, so outside of that, make sure your training's live. Yeah, of course. All the yeah. time. I, no matter right. how small the situation or how large the situation, do live work. Right, yeah. Make sure when you're doing live work, you always have an intention. You have to know what you want out of not only the practice that day or the round that day, but of the moment you're engaging in. You must know what you're doing or, or intending to do, right? And then you have to know where to focus your attention. And mm -hmm. I can help you with that. Mm -hmm. um, knowing uh, how to search for invariant features of the body mm -hmm. and how to uh, make invariant alignments that will help you get a consistent and known outcome would be where you put your attention. So if you're able to do that, you're going to get a lot out of not having a coach. Mm -hmm. So then let's say I'm in a situation, and I think this is pretty applicable for a lot of people out there who train at like traditional schools. Um, would it be necessary for me to communicate with like my rolling partner? Yes. Like these are the outcomes I'm looking for. These are the things I'm focusing on. Communicate with them ad hoc after afterwards. Okay. I see. So don't tell them what your intentions are. Like, hey, I really want to work in this situation. If I achieve this end, uh, we'll just flip flop or start again. Mm -hmm. If you achieve this end, we'll just flip flop and start again. But don't tell them what your tasks are. Mm. Kind of keep those hidden. Mm. And then experiment. Are, is your are, are your task focuses helping you achieve the objective you set? And then you analyze that afterwards. And you can ask them, what did you feel here? When, when I was trying to reach this objective, did you feel pressured? Did you feel like I was loose anywhere? And you can use what they experienced, their perception of you, to help mm -hmm. focus your intention and attention better. Right. So yeah, communicate, but communicate afterwards. Don't yeah. communicate during uh, the rounds. Okay, okay. Let that all just fucking happen and sink in. Okay. And then when you guys are done, just bullshit and figure out <laughs> Yeah, that's yeah. the best part of jiu -Jitsu. Oh yeah, man. <laughs> after, after, after class yeah. talking. Yeah. Um, so then, do you have any other general advice for like guys who train at traditional schools that want to implement your methods, your games, or just like the ecological approach in general? Yeah, man, learn enough to just get started. Learn enough about the science to understand what you're talking about. You don't have to go too deep. You just have to understand what the um, theory is trying to share, what, trying, what, what the theory is trying to teach you about how information um, is gained to help create new behaviors or behaviors at all. Mm -hmm. I want get enough to get started. And then, like I told you, know what your intention is and, and try to put some focus of attention. Look somewhere specifically to try to solve the problem. Uh, and then get lots of feedback through result, through trial and error. 
and then adjust as you need to. Don't look for a perfect solution from somebody else. Create one yourself. Mm -hmm. So if you take the responsibility of your own training and you focus hard and do what I just mentioned, anyone can start using this. You don't have to tell your coach. Just honestly, plug your fucking ears and they're talking. Just Because <laughs> most of it's nonsense anyway. Right, right, right. And you'll know the difference. Yeah. We're all smart enough to know when someone's bullshitting us. Yeah, We're like, yeah. nah, you don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> but have confidence in that, man. Yeah. You don't, there's no authority. Yeah. Just a bunch of jiu-jitsu guys trying to help each other out, you know? Right. Um, are there any guys like in particular that you keep an eye out for? Like you hear that they're about to like have a, a match or yeah. anything like that that you always try to watch? For sure. So I always watch Dan Hurst guys. Uh -huh. uh, so, you know, I, he, Ethan Carlson's coming out. I watch him. You know, uh, Luke, Dan, Buck, Luke Griffiths, you know, right, 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 um, yeah. Big Dan, yeah. uh, uh, Giancarlo, all those guys. Gordon Ryan. I always watch them because I know they're on the edge of good information. And I know Dan is going to try to create the best room that he can to try to get these athletes to the highest level. And right now, they're doing the best job. Mm -hmm. So if they're doing the best job, I want to see what their product looks like, right? So, uh, man, how did Gordon do? How did these guys, anyway, so I analyze them, you know? And I've actually noticed something, they're a little bit notchy. And this actually is why, is, is another reason why I'm, I'm moving away from that analytical right, information right. approach, because yeah. you can see it. You yeah, can yeah, see yeah. like this rigidness in their yeah. action. It's not bad action, they're, they're headed, I think, in the right direction, yeah. but again, it's, it's, they look like robots it's, a Yeah, bit. it's a little stiff. It's stiff, Yeah, right? I agree. And I'm not saying in a negative way, it's just a result yeah. of training, because training affects the behavior. Right. And it's stiff because the way they're searching for information is stiff. Right, right, right. They're taking this top-down thing, yeah. and they're thinking about it as they're training. Yeah, the language has influenced their actions. It does, yeah. I think so. Um, so I watch them. Uh, I, dude, I'm, I'm a big fan of the Pedigo guys. Okay. Um, even though they do, they do a lot of IP, a lot of drilling, I love their culture. Their culture yeah. is like dope. Like yeah. They're just hard-nosed country dudes who want to yeah. go out and fight. I love that. <laughs> and I, and they're, they're awesome. We talk all the time and, uh, when we're out. Uh, Dante Leon specifically, I think he's leveled up big time in the last two years. He has. Plus he strangled D, so of course i got to watch him because <laughs> we need that one back. <laughs> Come on, Dante, let's have it back. Uh, but no, I, I, he's great. I love those guys. Uh, so that's typically who I watch now. Uh -huh. yeah. What about from any other sports in particular? Um, yeah, uh, so I, I I always watch um, you know what the D1 American guys are doing. So mm -hmm. anyone who's going to make the world team or who's winning NCAA championships, I, I watch what they're doing. I, yeah. I kind of just watch them watch them fight. If I can find training footage, I love to watch that. But that's hard mm -hmm. to find. It's mm -hmm. pretty protected. Yeah. But you know, their competition footage is available. Uh, of course, freestyle wrestling. Uh, the high the higher guys, the international guys that are they're winning Olympic titles. I try to watch them. I like to watch the Iranians. Uh, for their hand fighting specifically, they're amazing hand fighters, particularly with underhooks. They seem to all organize around underhooking, so right. I like to see how they use that alignment to create specific effects on their opponents. Um, the Russians, of course, the Russians do a lot of uh, play wrestling, a lot of uh, you know yeah. live works. I like to see what they're coming up with. I don't know. That's you know that's who I watch. Mm. Um, do you have any opinions on? Or actually, maybe we can go back to what we talked about yesterday. Whatever you want, man. I'll, I'll Did, talk as long as you want. I really like what you said about uh, Mikey being a specialist because he's like someone personally I really like to watch okay. and implement his style. But you had a really interesting take on the his uh, style of jiu-jitsu. For sure. Yeah, and I was wondering if you could just re-elaborate on that. Yeah. So his style is is uh, he's a specialist. Yeah. Okay. He's uh -huh. a belly up open guard specialist. Uh huh. Uh, so that's the area he likes to fight in, and a lot of his tactics emerge from people not being able to deal with his alignment in that area. Mikey has a, a, a specific attribute relative to his body type and his flexibility that he can use to capitalize uh, on somebody coming at him forcefully. Uh, he's a, what we call a yielding player, which is yielding is a, a task to disperse energy in a, in a, in a, by receiving it, and he does that well. Uh, the problem with that type of style, though, is it's, um, it's uh, not multifaceted. It has, it has one direction, mm -hmm. um, and that can cause you to either get stalled out Mm -hmm. uh, or it can cause you to get burnt. Like someone could just slam into you until you get fatigued. Mm -hmm. And then since you can't turn the tide because you're only fighting in one direction, you can be overtaken. Mm -hmm. So though it has its strengths, it's very limited in its, in its capacity. Mm -hmm. So not that he's not skilled in that capacity because he is, we've all seen it. Yeah. It's just not, it's too specific for me. Right, right, right. I prefer something more general. I want to see him get off his back. I yeah. want to see him wrestle. I want to see right. him pass. I want to see a greater array of skill set. Yeah. And again, I, I don't see enough from him. But again, I'm not calling him a non-skilled player. He's just a specific Right, skilled right, player. Right, right. And the weakness to that really is that that's, uh, specificity is fragile. Yeah. So if everything about the situation doesn't line up perfectly, it's hard to get the outcomes we're searching for because mm -hmm. we can't create the mess that we need to change the way the situation is, is interacting. Right. No, and I agree. I think it's really cool when you see someone who doesn't care if they're on top, they're on bottom, they're wrestling. Like, there's something really baller about, like, the guy who can win anywhere. <laughs> no, I agree. Yeah. We actually, uh, one of our little, you know, heuristics for our culture is, let our opponents choose how they lose. 
If they give you your head, we'll take your head. If they That's give so you funny. Your head, I don't care. You, you can fight me wherever you want. I'm gonna, I'm gonna fucking beat you. Mm. And I like to create that spirit here in the room. Mm. You know, like if I have a, if a, a guy comes to visit, he's a great guard player, and no one passes him. I'm like, you, everyone, you try to pass this guy. I don't care how many times you get submitted. But a great passer, man, try to put this guy on his ass. Get under him. See if you can mm. do anything. Um, I really like to challenge that idea. Make my students immune to novelty. <laughs> you know, fight everywhere. Mm. Yeah, that's a really good idea. Do you ever watch the AOJ guys? I know they're mostly key specific, but what are your thoughts on them? They've Not been really, man. O only, so I'm interested in Cole. Yeah. Because he's so young. Yeah. Uh, I want to see what he's capable of. Yeah. Um, he's an amazing athlete. Uh -huh. uh, you know, he's focused, seems like a really intense dude. Like, I want to see what he's capable of. Yeah. But their style is, uh, again, out outside the Mendez brothers themselves. Yeah. I've never really liked anyone who comes from that camp. Uh -huh. I mean, the Menes brothers are fucking beasts. Yeah, of course. You know, you yeah. watch their old 2007 ADCC run, just, oh my God. Yeah. I thought I trained with them a lot. When they first came to America, uh, they came to, to TLI with oh, Bruno Frazado. Yeah, uh -huh. and we did like three days with them. And uh, they couldn't speak English yet. I think Guy was doing most of the instruction. He could speak a little bit, but Hoffa was very shaky on mm -hmm. his English. And uh, they were just, they were unreal. They where, were unreal. Where do you think Cole goes in the sport then? You said you, you like him. Like, what do you think is special about him? And where do you see his future? I think he's just, he's a disciplined athlete. You can tell yeah. that he really cares about um, staying healthy, yeah. doing everything he can to reach the highest level, whatever that may be for him. I don't really know, because I don't know him personally. I don't yeah. know what, he wants to split his time between Gi and no Gi. I don't know if ADCC is his aspirations, but it seems like it is. So it seems like no matter what, which path he chooses, he wants to go to the top. And that's what interests me. And he fights like a guy who wants to go to the top. So I want to see what he's capable of. Is he able to reach the top, the pinnacle in both sports, or is he going to split off and choose one or the other? I'm just curious. I want to see what he, what he, what he, what he, how far he goes. Plus, if Noah wants to be a guy, he's going to have to beat Cole because they're going to be in the same division eventually. So that's going to be the guy, if he makes it, that Noah's going to have to beat, or one of the guys, right? So I, I assume that Cole's going to go pretty far in the 77-kilogram division yeah, yeah. Uh, for ADCC. Yeah. So, you know, and there's a lot of fucking badasses in that division, don't get me wrong, but he seems to be the youngest guy that's, right, that's right. striving. He has a long that. future. He has, he has a, long, a lot of chances, yeah. Future, yeah. Okay, so last question. Um, so you've been really on a tear um, with promoting the ecological approach, do you feel your life these days has been more fulfilling? Like uh, teaching this way and preaching this way and kind of, you know, attracting a specific kind of attention? Um, attention wasn't what I wanted to attract. I really wanted to get involved in the conversation, right? I wanted to, to make enough noise and piss enough people off that they would listen. <laughs> I think I did that. Yeah. So I really just wanted to be part of the conversation. I really wanted to let people know that there's another way to do things, a more efficient way to do things. And I kind of wanted to take the reins off of traditionalism and give it back to the, the students who really should be the central focus of practice, not mm -hmm. the coach. Mm -hmm. And so that was what I wanted to do. And in doing so, I wanted to attract people who wanted to train seriously. Like, I'm trying to be like a new wave or like a unity or, mm -hmm. or a, where you have a school where there's a group of guys who are pointed at the top. Yeah. I want to be at school like that. So hopefully, if anyone listens to me, if this ever comes out, or if anyone else ever hears this shit, they come here, they train with us. We're serious, man. We're not. We're yeah. not fucking. No, I felt it. I don't know what level the guy I rolled with in your like all levels class was, but he like he felt so good. Like Romero. Romero, yeah, yeah. Blue belt. Blue belt, yeah, yeah. Like I had, I like really was like, wow, I really don't know how to keep someone down. Like <laughs> I was like, holy cow, like yeah. this is really tough. But dude, yeah. what's interesting is I was like, I was watching you guys the whole time, uh -huh. and. Uh, he wasn't able to deal with uh, some of your inversions and the way that you were fighting for like, let's say getting to the hips when going underneath towards the back. Right, yeah. And I could tell that that skill came from Unity because that's, that's a skill out there that you see a lot. I do, because those guys do that well. Right, 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 and you yeah. were able to perform that series of skills well against him. He could not solve that novelty all the time. And so, of course, in my mind, I'm like, oh, we got to fix his training. This week. Uh, but either way, it was very nice to watch you guys interact because, again, you were novel to him. Uh -huh. uh, no, he was novel to me, like completely. Like someone willing to just, like for him, a winning outcome is sitting up. Like that was crazy. And I'm assuming he's better than me at wrestling. So it's like, that's bad for me, honestly. So it's like, I should have been able to keep him down if I could. I agree. Yeah. And I did, when I watched you, I, I was like, he, you're, I, you didn't look confident in holding him down and staying close. Yeah, yeah. So I could tell that was an area that you haven't worked that much. But it's good. It was nice for me to see. So, like, if you were my student, I would, of course, be immediately talking to you about that. <laughs> yeah. right? So, hey, man, Nate, this is where our focus is going to go over the next couple of weeks. These yeah. are the skill you're sort of weak in, and this is the direction we're going to go in. But, man, you guys were great. Yeah, he's he's been training for about three years now, mm. um, and uh, yeah, he's one of the eight one of the eight main guys who are here all the time, mm -hmm. and uh, he's trying to be as good as he can be. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. He was it was it was a good training session. I thought you guys had it was good. 
All right. Thanks for doing this. Yeah, bro. I appreciate, I appreciate this. It, man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll reach out if I have any other questions. I probably will. Whatever, yeah. dude. I'm I appreciate cool it. it. Thank you. Yeah, and whether you ever put it, doesn't matter if you mm -hmm. want to just put this on your thing or, or it's cool with me. And if not, okay. so just use it for yourself. Yeah. Show your friends. I don't give a fuck. Okay. Cool. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, it's all yours, man. Do what you want with it.